we're doing it right by the Opus Light Rail Station, and that seems to be where people are more bold. There's less NIMBY when you when you build up your yep. light rail. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. And uh, and that opportunity uh, is coming to Eper as well Absolutely. as an opportunity if we choose to talk about that, like as an opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, I. I, I lived in Washington, D.C. for five years. I actually lived in Moscow for four or five years. You know, all these places, they have lots of density in Chicago for a little bit, right? Lots of density and walkability. Now, if you want to go out in the woods, you go do that, right? That's great. But, but like, there's a hub to it. Having one building doesn't create that kind of um, energy and community and ecosystem. But having a bunch of them around does. Right? So we're creating sort of these new neighborhoods, like around light rail and other places, that have the potential to just, I mean, that's where I want to be, right? You go to, what's the Maple, um, Maple Grove, there's like a arcade, I don't know. Anyhow, there's lots of these, even, even Southfield in Edina mm -hmm. is starting to say, oh my gosh, we built all around cars, and now we're using up our parking lots to build housing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And try to get more walkability in this, and all these places that people want to be and walk around, and have a community, yeah, right? So it's a positive, it's an asset, right? Not a, so um, I don't want to lose too much time, so let's just go, the, the last area is then, like, so we need to invest, right? We have evidence-based data, all these things that say what works, right? Um, have any of you heard or read the book um, by Matthew Desmond called Evicted? Strongly recommend you read that book. Matthew Desmond is a New York Times best-selling author, and he wrote a book called Evicted after he lived in Milwaukee for a while and followed a bunch of families, and frankly a bunch of landlords in Milwaukee, looking at the cycles of eviction. Um, and, and one of the conclusions out of that is that, you know, 90 plus, well over 90% of evictions do you know what they're caused by? What, what, what would we think? Why are people getting a big rent? Actually, it's, it's money. Most of it is that people can't afford it. And then they're getting evicted because they're behind or they're late on payments. It's a, and all that means is that then when they try to get the next housing, they can't get, they can't get it. now their rental history is worse, so they're getting charged more for housing, and then they try to they pay that one. And then they can't afford that, so they lose that housing, and these cycles continue. And it's just, it's documented in a very, uh, two-thirds of the book is the story. One-third is just all the footnotes and research. So, <laughs> well documented. But um, So rental assistance, just helping people pay the dang rent, works. Right? <laughs> it actually works. Um, but let me ask this. Um, I'm a homeowner. Are there other homeowners in the room too? So, um, and uh, of, and maybe I've already given this away, but who do you think receives most assistance from the federal government in housing? Homeowners. It's not what we think about, is it? Usually you say, oh, who's getting housing assistance? And you have an image in your head, right? of a family, of a situation, of who is it that's getting all these federal subsidies for housing? Well, guess what? If you're eligible for rental assistance because you're quite so poor, and our federal um, rental subsidy uh, rules say, oh, you, you should be getting rental assistance because you meet all the criteria we have outlined, even if you're eligible, only one out of every four families that's eligible get rental assistance. I get the mortgage, home mortgage deduction yeah. uh, credit, yeah. property tax credit. Yeah. So do I. Yeah. yeah. Of course. Yeah. They're thinking and taking it away. So, so have you done this? And have there been limits to like, well, you signed up first, so I don't get it. No. Every eligible homeowner over decades have, who's eligible to get that home mortgage interest deduction gets it. There's no limit that says only one out of every four homeowners gets that home mortgage interest deduction, right? So why is that? Why is this happening? 
the government's rewarding you to take investment in your houses and that, whatever it's based off of the, the government's giving you a break on your own investment in your house. Right, but we could have created policies. I'll jump to my conclusion. Yeah. It's because the people who are making the policies have expertise in this. Yeah. This is their lived experience. They understand right. why it's important for home ownership, what their experience has been, what would facilitate it. We don't have enough people informing decisions that have expertise in this, right? That understand the challenges and the benefits of getting this. And so all of these are intentional policies that then roll up together. And again, that to me says that we can change the policies, right? All of this is a result of policies that we now have the agency, if we can organize on it, to change. And so can I say something about this? Please. So um, this is an example of having a policy that could do more for that 80%, mm -hmm. right? So then you'd open up more affordable housing for those that are less than that mm -hmm. to be able to put them in land trusts. Yes, absolutely. I think a land trust is a home ownership model that keeps the cost of the land um, in sort of, a, a, takes the cost of the land out of the cost of housing so that people can get into home ownership and build equity and without having to pay sort of those full costs. It keeps it affordable. Right. And, and it's a great model. Break. What's that? They still get a percentage of interest break. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The same kind. Yeah. So I'm not saying bad home ownership at all. No, we no, no, need for sure. But I'm saying if you, it's a way that a policy could be changed to open that door exactly. for more affordable housing. That's, that's right. in units. Right. That's right. Right. That's right. That's right. And we need both the the private finance industry to roll up, you know, to figure that out and start investing in those models, as well as you know local policies, as well as the public will to make all to ask for that and make that happen. Right. Um, so, you know, just a quick note on the federal, you know, we talk about rent subsidies. It's a proven way to end homelessness, to create housing stability. It works. Right? And yet, over time, and these numbers are actually um, in even, um, the disinvestment in rental assistance is, is growing. But, like, we literally, despite all the growth we've had in our population, we actually have fewer rental assistance available in Minnesota than we have in the past, right? So, 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 even while our population has grown, remember my favorite chart, twenty-five hundred a year that's needed at the very lowest income, who we'll all need rental assistance. We have a growing need, and yet a declining investment in rental assistance that traditionally has come from the rest of the federal government. But wouldn't it be better? than rental assistance to have a uh, $25 an hour. Right. Yeah. <laughs> because, uh, yeah. Because this is just a distortion, right? No, you know, let's absolutely. Get, let's get the cool people. These are all, again, I think they're all two sides of the same coin. You're absolutely right. You pay folks $25 an hour, and they can, so we probably have to have that battle all on all fronts. Yeah. yeah. All connected. It's all, and it's all connected. Right. And so, yeah, I'm not going to disagree with that at all. Um, there's lots of other strategies to leverage investments. And at the local level, there's great opportunities through creating a local housing trust fund. If your community, whether it's Eden Prairie or Bloomington or wherever, has not yet done that, do it. What it allows for you is to have local investments in your own community in creating um, housing for everyone in your community. And oftentimes, those local housing trust funds can then be matched by state and other uh, funding as well. I'm, I'm going to just jump over this real quick. Um, we've talked about evictions. I do want to talk about this. So remember we talked about intentional policies mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that have created the situation in which yeah. we're in? You cannot talk about housing without talking about the racial disparities yeah. in housing, right? Your zip code you're born in is going to be the best determinant of your economic opportunity and success. And that doesn't seem quite right, right? So what we know right now is that 
Um, in home ownership, if you're a household of color, you're half as likely to be a homeowner. We know that if you're a, a person of color or a household of color, you're two and a half times more likely to be paying way too much for your housing than you really can afford. And we know if you're a person of color that your likelihood of being homelessness is almost six times higher. Wow. Jeez. Right? And so a lot of this was, you know, um, there's a great, there's a great exhibit right now at the Lincoln History Museum. Mm -hmm. Did you even know we had an history? Mm -hmm. We do. It's by the uh, Minneapolis Institute of Arts in uh, Minneapolis, South Franklin and Third or so. They're doing this great exhibit, and made it travels too, on uh, racial covenants in the Twin Cities. Oh, wow. And how years ago, when you look at what the federal government, after World War II, and they're doing all these um, um, federal housing administration loans for folks that were coming back from the war and all that, that really helped build out the suburbs, mm -hmm. you look at where they, the federal government told the banks where they could lend and where they couldn't lend, right. which really was clearly outlining where people of color were living. And that was, what, 1950? And you look at those lines today, and they're almost identical. So we have created and perpetuated these racial disparities over time. But it was, it was policies that did it. So that means we have an opportunity to create policies that don't do that and actually create a more equitable opportunities for housing that don't and mean that your race is going to be determinant of your housing outcomes, right? Okay, so what are we going to do? What do you do? <coughs> so, someone called this diva, but I like Abbott. <laughs> <laughs> you can choose, right? <laughs> what, you, what you want there. Um, what I would say is uh, advocate. Advocate. You know, um, as a city council member, my experience generally is, when an issue comes up, the people who don't like it, I hear from in scads, right? Like they're all telling me exactly what they don't like. Do you, but I don't hear a whole lot from the folks that are sort of like, oh, I heard about that, sounds great. They don't bother to call your, their local officials and tell them, <laughs> right? And that's a missing voice in all these conversations, right? Yeah. So I'd just like to point yeah, out that oh, yeah. Pox Christie is, is connected to go. part of the Eden Prairie Community Housing Coalition. And we have shown up at City Council meetings to say thank you to the city on those projects that are doing really great. Excellent. So we, we should all continue to do that as much as possible because it really does make a difference. And are there other folks from uh, local housing uh, organizing groups that might want to talk about what you're doing? Yeah, please. Yeah, we're, uh, a number of us are here from the Minnetonka group. Uh -huh. That's part of the suburban housing Excellent. Uh, network. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're trying to work with city council members on policies, on comp plan feedback. Uh, tenant protection. Tenant protection, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Anyone else already? Yeah, that's um, I'm with an organization called Alliance for Metropolitan Stability. We've been working with the Eden Prairie Affordable Housing Coalition. Asad Aliway, who was sitting next to me, he had to leave early. He's with the New American Development Center, uh, which organizes the Somali residents here in Eden Prairie, a substantial part of the population here. Um, the reason why we're in Eden Prairie is because there's a viable pathway for moving affordable housing in a very well-organized local population. Uh, not just the Somali population, but the folks here at Pax Christi. We've done two housing forums working very closely with Joan. She's the leader. And over 250 people showed up at each, each one, April uh, two years ago and just a few weeks ago. So you have a new city council. You have a new mayor. You have new city staff. You have new affordable housing projects that are going up. So you've got a lot of hope. You also have a lot of challenges. Anne showed you that there are basically three to four pillars for housing. So one is new production. You've got a couple of new things happening, and you might have more with the light rail. She showed you that tenant protections are very important. 
Assad will tell you that Section 8 vouchers are being less and less accepted here in, uh, in Prairie. You've got some project-based Section 8 apartment buildings, too. Um, the Somali community, the broader uh, Muslim community, believes a lot of folks are leaving in Prairie and moving to places like Shakopee and Chaska because it's more affordable for them. And uh, the other piece is the preservation, which Anne spoke wonderfully about, about the need to preserve. You have a lot of affordable housing here. Whether it stays affordable or not is up to all of us. And lastly, and Joan might have been giving you guys this one, but um, because of the advocacy work that Joan and her leaders have been doing, the city has invited the Housing Coalition to come to a workshop that they're doing this Tuesday night. Ooh, got cards, reminder cards. So, oh, reminder cards. Okay. so I think Joan is going to deputize every one of you to be part of the Very Affordable <laughs> Housing Coalition. It's Tuesday night, 5.30 p.m. It's going to be for an hour. It's at the, civic, the city center in the Heritage Rooms. And they're going to be talking about inclusionary housing and some of the tenant protections work. Um, Besides being in command of the facts, the most important thing is to fill the room. We've already filled the room here today. If half of you could go and show up on Tuesday night, it will make a very positive impression on the city council members, the planning commission members who are going to be there, and the human rights commission folks who will be there. Thanks, Ralph. Anyone else want to talk about yes? So, Anne, I'm, I'm Jennifer Munt. I represent this area on the Metropolitan Council. During the polar vortex, we um, counted the homeless who are on our trains. And um, we, we went with St. Stephen's and the street outreach workers, and we saw upwards of 200 people who were homeless on the trains. And um, that was a human face of our housing crisis. There was a 29-year-old pregnant woman with schizophrenia. There was a Vietnam veteran who lost his shoes and he's going to lose his feet from frostbite. And if anybody thinks this isn't a crisis, they just need to come on one of our trains in the winter. But I also think it's a travesty if we only care about people when the temperatures dip below zero. You know, we need to be concerned about them all, all the time. So the governor will come out with a budget on February 19th. We will be supporting people who are asking for $15 million in emergency assistance for shelters. We've got churches and synagogues and mosques that have space for the homeless but they don't have the funding for the security to right. keep people safe, for the breakfast so that they can send folks with a warm, healthy meal in the mornings. So that's the first part. But it's more about helping Anne with a long-term solution for housing affordability. Um, in, in my world, one of the toughest decisions that we've ever had to make on the Met Council was when the federal government cut our funding for housing. We provide um, 6,500 rental assistance vouchers, Section 8 vouchers. And every time that we open up the waiting list, 32,000 people apply for 6,500 vouchers. And the federal government said to us, we're cutting funding. And what that me meant for me as a policymaker is that we had to ask every family that had a three bedroom voucher to move, to yank their kids out of school and to move into a two bedroom situation. I mean, the unintended consequences of that are things like incest, right? Um, and, and it's, we, we can't. I, I appreciate Anne's optimism because you can you can feel that you're in a box where you can't do anything. And I really think we can when people like those of you in this room are the wind at our backs and that we push for the funding and for the policy making that can change this. So I know it's almost two o'clock and if anyone has a last burning comment or announcement or something they want to say, 
I, I would only correct you on this, which is it's not about helping me. I'm here to help you guys. The only way these things happen is that if you are taking action. Because if it's a bunch of us who sort of spend our days doing this, that's not what's going to move the dial. What moves the dial is when the whole community says, you know, we all have skin in the game. I'm an employer and I need housing because I need to get some, attract some workers and, you know, I've got kids that keep coming back to the house because they can't afford the housing out there and I need that and, um, you know, the person taking care of my mom is driving an hour to take care of her and is exhausted. We, need, we all have skin in the game on this and, you, you know, I'm here to help you guys to uh, get this done. So I'll stick around a couple minutes, but thank you so much for the conversation. Thank you. Yeah. delve into this structure piece, you know, to really understand the structures that are impeding what we all know would be blessed community. It's like, it's so clear. Thank you very much, but it's such a complex issue. But thanks for your charts. Yeah. Your <laughs> oh, I have more. <laughs>